Good morning and welcome to chapel. I'm so glad you're here today. I'm going to open up with a word of prayer and then I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, David Faber to come and to introduce our speaker for today. As uh, today we're having uh, the Bible department and uh, is putting on the X audio lecture series and so uh, I'm sure Dr. Faber will also remind you, but there's a, a, an evening session tonight uh, where Dr. Faya is going to come and uh, share with us as well, but uh, t today he's going to share with us in chapel. So I'm really excited for that. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Faber. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you for this morning. It's another day to live for you, to love you, to serve you, to love others around us. So I just thank you for uh, the beautiful weather you've given us and this opportunity to come and to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, speak to our hearts, that you would be able to um, open up something new, teach us something new about who you are and uh, how we might live out this Christian life. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We give this time to you. We ask if there's anything that's, that's distracting us, that's uh, keeping us from being able to hear you, hear from you, that you would uh, just help us to block that out and just to set this time aside just for you. We focus our eyes and our attentions on you now, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please help me welcome Dr. Faber as he comes to introduce our chapel speaker today. Good morning. Today's chapel is part one of uh, this year's X Audio Lectureship. As Ryan said, I'm David Faber. I'm professor of philosophy here at Tabor, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. The Tabor X Audio Lectureship in Vocation and Service is an annual academic lectureship in which a scholar is invited to present on a meaningful expression of Christian discipleship that arises from her or his professional discipline. The purpose of the lectureship is to challenge and encourage believers in their individual and collective calling of work and service for Christ and his kingdom. We are pleased to have as our lecturer this year, Dr. John Fia. He is Distinguished Professor of American History at Messiah College in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, where he's taught since 2002. He's the author of numerous books, including Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? A Historical uh, Introduction, which was one of the three finalists for the George Washington Book Prize, one of the largest prizes in uh, literary prizes in the United States. And that is the basis for his talk this evening at 7. Uh, he also has written a book called Why Study History? Uh, a book called The Way of Improvement Leads Home. Uh, he's edited numerous books. He is the author of multiple essays and reviews, some in academic journals, uh, some in uh, the more popular press. He's a great example of an academic who has not only other academics as his audience, but has a much broader audience as well. So he has written for the Journal of American History, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the uh, Journal of the Early Republic, but also for Christianity Today and Christian Century, uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Post, USA Today, Fox News, CBS News, uh, the New York Daily News, uh, and lots of other newspapers. Uh, he blogs daily at the Way of Improvement Leads Home, which is a blog ded dedicated to American history, religion, politics, and academic life, and, serves, and he serves as the executive editor of Current, an online magazine of opinion and commentary. He's uh, lectured widely. He's appeared on NBC News, CNN, C-SPAN, MSNBC, uh, MSNBC, and dozens of radio programs across the country. Uh, he's also a fan of the New York Mets. Um, thought maybe there'd be a cheer from somebody on that. Um, and the <laughs> uh, father of uh, 
two daughters who are recent uh, college graduates as well. So please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Dr. John Fia. Good morning, Tabor College. Great to be with you. Uh, I came in yesterday, uh, flew into Wichita, took that long drive. I can't remember what the highway was. I uh, got to see a nice piece of Kansas uh, that I hadn't seen before. Um, but again, it's, it's good to be with you. I bring you greetings from uh, one of your sister Christian colleges, Messiah University in, in uh, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania uh, area. Um, Probably not a good time to mention that I'm a Mets fan. If there's any baseball fans here, you know we, we just had a really bad season. Fired our manager yesterday, Buck Showalter. Um, but yeah, I am a Mets fan, die hard. But uh, I've met a couple of Detroit Lions fans actually today too. So they know what it's like to be long suffering when it comes to, <laughs> who do you guys root for there? Is it the Chiefs? Are you in Chiefs country? No, no, who is? All right, that, that, was, that was not the best question to ask. <laughs> so again, it's good to be with you. I'll be, again, um, if you like what you hear today or uh, just have a curiosity about um, some of the things that I've been talking about today, uh, love to see you tonight at 7 o'clock as well for the second part of the lecture. So again, it's been a, a good visit so far, great hospitality here, and I'm looking forward to spending the day with some of you, even some of you in classes from what I understand. So uh, that'll be good. For wisdom is her name, and she is not readily perceived by many. Come to her with all your soul, and keep her ways with all your might. Search out and seek, and she will become known to you. And when you get hold of her, do not let go. For at last you will find the rest she gives, and she will be changed into joy for you. What will they say about us? Future historians, I mean. What will those guardians of the past write when they look back on the last several years of American history? As a historian myself, I am very careful about making predictions. We don't make predictions, we historians. We talk about the past. But I'm still pretty sure that there will be generations of American historians who pay special attention to the time in which we now live. A season of divisive and cutthroat politics. A pandemic that has changed everything. A collective cry for racial justice on American streets and in public discourse. Screaming matches over what we should teach our children in schools and an acrimonious debate over the best way to balance what Thomas Jefferson called our pursuits of happiness with the pursuit of the common good. Sadly, many of our churches have not provided havens from this storm. The issues I just described have divided the body of Christ to a degree that I have not witnessed in my lifetime. These times call for discernment. They call for clear thinking, compassion, courage, conviction. In other words, this moment cries out for educated people, women and men who are willing to commit themselves to the development of the intellectual and spiritual resources necessary to lead us through a complex and rapidly changing world. I know I speak for the administration and the faculty of Tabor College when I invite you to join in this life-changing, outward-looking, and kingdom-building work. I know your administration and your faculty are glad that you are here at Tabor. So, what does it mean, then, to be an educated person? Better yet, what does it mean to pursue a Christian education at a place like Tabor College? Is it enough that professors pray before class, that students are required to attend chapel, 
and that opportunities for worship and spiritual growth abound on this campus. I know that if I surveyed your professors, I would probably get a variety of different answers to the question of what Christian education means at Tabor. And perhaps some of you have your own experiences about what a Christian university education should look like. I hope these are questions and issues that you take up regularly in your classes and that they're conversations that you have this academic year. But today, I want to leave you with some of my own ever-evolving thoughts on the matter. It seems to me that Christian education must center on two concepts, risk and wisdom. Risk and wisdom. Let me explain. If it has not happened to you already, there will be a point in your education here at Tabor when you will encounter an idea that you had either never considered before or you believe is wrong based upon your previous education or your upbringing, your family background, maybe something you learned, up, grow, learned growing up in church. You will be exposed to this idea in a lecture, a group discussion maybe, a class assignment, a presentation from another student, or maybe the close reading of a text. Because the person or the writer offering this idea is someone you respect, or perhaps someone who has thought much longer and much harder about this issue than you have, you will conclude that you should take this new idea seriously. And the more you think about it, the more you realize that if you accept this idea to be true and thus begin to incorporate this idea into your view of the world, it might change who you are. If you were to embrace this idea to make it your own, so to speak, it might completely reorient your understanding of a particular ethical or social problem. It may make you reevaluate your politics. It might reshape the way you think about your Christian faith. It could even change the very trajectory of your life. But if you want to be an educated person, you cannot ignore what is happening to you as a result of learning this new thing. You will no doubt be tempted to ignore this prompting. I know there are video games and TikToks and snaps and chats and Chiefs Jets games. They're always there to attract, distract you. But the pursuit of education requires you to take an intellectual risk. Such risk taking is always uncomfortable because it requires giving up part of yourself for the sake of the truth or a better way. The possibility of rethinking what you have always known can be scary. It can complicate relationships even with those we love. It might have an effect on your friendships. It can be mentally and even physically exhausting because if you take this exercise seriously, you just may lose some sleep over the problem. Still, you must be willing to walk to the end of the platform and consider diving. You must be willing to stand on one side of the mountain and consider crossing the bridge to the other side. You must be willing to come out of the comfort of the cave of familiarity and into the light of possibility. Has anyone read Plato's Republic in the room, right? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You must be open to seeing the world anew. If you are not willing to take these risks, you will not be educated. Now, sure, you'll graduate. You'll graduate maybe from Taylor or Tabor with a degree. You'll have training in some specific skill. You may even be well on your way to a comfortable middle-class life but you will not be an educated person. And our democracy, our churches, and our world needs educated people. 
Well, now that I've either scared or angered all of you, let me turn to the rest of the story. Earlier I said that education requires risk and wisdom. One of my mentors, a historian named Mark Schwain, I'll introduce you to him fully, more fully in a moment, described the relationship between risk and wisdom this way. Self-denial or risk-taking is the disposition to surrender ourselves for the sake of a better, or of the better opinion. But wisdom is the discernment of when it is reasonable to do so. Let me repeat that. Self-denial or risk-taking is the disposition to surrender ourselves for the sake of a better opinion. But wisdom is the discernment of when it is reasonable to do so. In other words, wisdom is what we need to decide whether to jump, whether to cross, whether to walk out into the sun, or whether to make the new idea our own. Now this approach to wisdom means that sometimes wisdom will teach us that the new idea we are considering is wrong. And we can't make it our own and still continue to remain true to ourselves and our neighbors. This approach to education also implies that sometimes we will embrace a new concept when we really shouldn't. Maybe we are swayed by the winds of peer pressure or the latest fad. Everyone else seems to believe this new idea, so I guess I should as well. Perhaps we are swayed by the opinions of those who pontificate on our social media feeds in search of instant celebrity or, the, or our uncontrolled passions that can too easily suppress the exercise of our reason. This is not the stuff of wisdom. All of this is the stuff of folly, the way of the fool, as Proverbs describes those who turn their backs on wisdom. I like the Living Bible translation of Proverbs 14.8. The wise man looks ahead, the fool attempts to fool himself, and won't face facts. If you Google the word wisdom, you will find hundreds of definitions. But for the sake of this morning's talk, let's use the theologian Dorothy Bass's definition. Quote, wisdom is the good judgment someone shows in the face of every dilemma. It is the ability to render a proper assessment of a situation and to act rightly as a result. So where does one find this kind of wisdom? Maybe some of you are asking. How does one decide how to render a proper assessment of a situation or decide whether to, uh, whether to take in a new way of seeing the world? For Christians, of course, the first place to look for this kind of wisdom is God. The book of James says that if, you, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. The Bible often describes wisdom as God's gift to us. So when you come to that crossroads in your intellectual life, or when you are challenged by that new concept, Remember that God's grace is there. But to ask God for this kind of wisdom, of course, requires a commitment to certain spiritual disciplines, such as prayer, meditation on the scriptures, fasting even, to name a few. When we seamlessly fuse these spiritual disciplines with our quest to be educated people, we put into practice Jesus' command to love the Lord your God with not just our hearts, souls, and strength, but with our minds. For example, how many, don't raise your hands, how many of you pray for wisdom before you sit down at your desk to start schoolwork? I'm not talking God help me pass this test kind of prayer, right? I didn't study for it, but maybe God will intervene in some miraculous way and I will get a C minus. But how many of you pray in the ways that I'm speaking about here for wisdom 
I found helpful St. Thomas Aquinas' prayer before study, a helpful tool in helping me to center myself when I work, when I do intellectual work. Over the years, I've posted it somewhere near my desk to remind myself as I study and encounter things that are new, new ideas, that God is there, ready to provide wisdom to help me sort through it all. Aquinas prays, ineffable creator, you are proclaimed the true font of light and wisdom and the primal origin raised high beyond all things. Pour forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of my mind. Disperse from my soul the twofold darkness into which I was born, sin and ignorance. You make eloquent the tongues of infants. Refine my speech and pour forth upon my lips the goodness of your blessing. Grant to me keenness of mind, capacity to remember, skill in learning, subtlety to interpret, and eloquence in speech. May you guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to completion. You who are true God and true man, who live and reign world without end. Amen. Try that. Send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the prayer. Try it sometimes when you sit down at your desk to go write that term paper or study for that next exam. Wisdom, the discernment of whether to surrender ourselves for the sake of the better opinion, is also cultivated in communities, in community. We can often find wisdom through conversations with trusted advisors, parents, pastors, youth pastors, former teachers, books, even the texts left behind from women and men who in the process of their own educations endured the same kind of risk-taking. God works through these relationships. And don't forget your faculty. Most of them have PhDs, doctors of philosophy. In the ancient world, a philosopher was a title given to a lover of wisdom. So if you think about it this way, your professors are literally doctors of wisdom in their particular fields of study. It is also likely that somewhere along the way, they've wrestled with some of the same issues you are wrestling with. And in most cases, they are still wrestling with those issues and looking for conversation partners to join them on their intellectual journeys. Keep your professors busy during office hours. They will help you on the path toward wisdom. And in the process, you just might find a lifelong mentor or two. The pursuit of wisdom also happens in communities of friendship, the kind of potentially deep relationships forged around conversations about things that matter. Many of you may be familiar with Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens the wit of another, the wits of another. I like, again, I like the Living Bible translation of this verse. It goes like this. A friendly discussion is as stimulating as the sparks that fly when iron strikes iron. Now, bear with me here while I bring my knowledge of American history, expertise in American history to bear on this question, because American history is filled with examples of women and men pursuing these kinds of friendships in pursuit of wisdom. So for example, in the 18th century uh, in Philadelphia, artisans, craftsmen gathered together on Friday evenings for conversation about current events, political affairs, science, moral issues. One of the members of this group was a man named Benjamin Franklin, and he called his community that met every Friday afternoon, the Junto. He described it as a club of mutual improvement conducted in the sincere spirit of inquiry after truth. This intellectual fellowship of blacksmiths and carpenters, bakers and printers grew so popular that it evolved into the American Philosophical Society, a society for the advancement of knowledge that still exists today on Fifth Street, right across the cobblestone, if you ever visit Philadelphia, right across the cobblestone from Independence Hall. In the early 19th century, Frederick Douglass, an enslaved man not much younger than you are right now, 
was gathering with young people his age, white and black, on the docks in Baltimore. Through their conversations, Douglas learned the ideals that shaped the nation's birth and how the founders did not apply those ideals to him because of the color of his skin. When he returned to his Maryland plantation, Douglas met his fellow enslaved men and women under the shade of trees in the woods behind an old barn, and he taught them everything he had learned in Baltimore. Later, he would return to Baltimore and join the East Baltimore Mental Improvement Society. How about that for a name? This was a club of free blacks devoted to discussing issues related to race, slavery, religion, and politics. As an enslaved person yearning to be free, Douglas was always taking physical risks, including ultimately his escape from slavery. But he regularly took intellectual risks as well, and he used these communities of conversation and discussion to help him make wise decisions about how to respond to the new things he was learning through his voluminous reading and study. These fellowships were essential to Douglass's pursuit of liberty and launched his career as the 19th century's most important abolitionist. One more example. In 1805, a group of 16 unmarried women started the Boston Gleaning Society. Excuse me, Boston Gleaning Circle where they built relationships and female solidarity around the reading of poetry, the discussion of history, theology, geography, and the sharing of short essays. They always started their meetings with a reading from the Bible, perhaps to remind themselves that their efforts to discern the times needed to happen in the context of the author of all wisdom. Their stated goal for the meeting was to search for truth. They explored questions such as, what is virtue? What is conducive to improvement, the study of books or the study of mankind? What is the use of studying botany? The Gleaning Society's constitution stated, we should never or should ever consider the importance of storing our minds with useful knowledge, but at the same time, it has a more than ordinary claim on our attention. It is the great end which we ourselves have proposed in forming this society. And next to communion with our God, it is the most sublime employment which we can be engaged. The Gleaning Society became the first literary society in America, and these societies became the backbone of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Now, I often talk about these societies when I teach um, general education students in my United States survey course, my United States history course. And when I talk about these communities of learning, I often ask the students in the class to consider continuing these conversations when they get back to their dorms and their homes. The request usually garners laughs from the students. Some of them are eye rolling, some of them are just shocked or think that I'm crazy to suggest that they would return home, to return back to the dorm, and start talking about schoolwork with their friends, their families, or dorm mates. But let me suggest that this is precisely the kind of practice that cultivates wisdom. It is in these conversations where education, real education, and not just degree training, happens. So, who of you out there are going to be the first to start the Tabor Gleaning Society? Or the Hillsboro Mental Improvement Society? <laughs> the invitation has been issued. Someone get the coffee brewing. There is wisdom to pursue. And by the way, if you do this, send me an email. I'd love to hear about it. At the start of this talk, I quoted from a piece of ancient wisdom literature. It is a passage from the book of Sirach, a part of the Catholic Church's canon of inspired works. 
Let me read it again, this time in a larger context. My child, from your youth choose discipline. And when you have gray hair, you will still find wisdom. Come to her like one who plows and sows and wait for her good harvest. For when you cultivate her, you will toil but little and soon you will eat of her produce. She seems very harsh to the undisciplined. Fools cannot remain with her. She will be like a heavy stone to test them and they will not delay in casting her aside. For wisdom is like her name. She is not readily perceived by many. If you love to listen, you will gain knowledge. And if you pay attention, you will become wise. Attach yourself to such a one. Be ready to listen to every godly discourse and let no wise proverbs escape you. If you see an intelligent person, rise early to visit him. Let your foot wear out her doorstep. Reflect on the statutes of the Lord and meditate at all times on his commandments. Come to her with all your soul and keep her ways with all your might. Search out and seek wisdom and she will become known to you. And when you get hold of her, do not let go. For at last you will, you will be given the rest she gives and she will be changed into joy for you. Earlier, I referenced one of my mentors. You get to see a picture of him here now, Mark Schwain, uh, professor of humanities at Valparaiso University in Indiana, where I taught for two years before coming to Messiah University in 2002. And in a reflection on Sirach, chapter 6, the passage that I just read, Schwain captures beautifully the ultimate end of wisdom. He writes, when you are fully and completely at work in your callings as seekers of wisdom, you will sense intimation of this everlasting joy, foretastes of the feast to come, as it were. In the midst of those small transactions of everyday life, you will, from time to time, figure something out, discover some part of the truth about the world, catch a fragment of the logos or the word, and see the flicker of light in the darkness. And when this happens, you will have an evanescent sense of deep joy that can be fully known only in eternity. As we pursue wisdom, we see through a glass darkly. We will know only in part, but every now and then the light will shine through. And we will get a glimpse of what it is like to see face to face, to know even as we are also known. We will get a taste of this place characterized by shalom, where the brokenness of this world is restored. It will be a place where we don't have to worry about risk-taking anymore because everything is true and good. Maybe we will even end up with those faithful wisdom seekers of days gone by, and they will break bread with us, and they'll answer all our questions, and there will be great joy. But for now, we wait. We wait in hope for that coming kingdom. And we press on in the work before us. May God be with you as you take risks and seek wisdom this academic year. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Fia. If you want to go ahead and get your phones out while you're doing that, I will remind you that um, tonight at 7 p.m. in the same place, uh, you can come back and hear uh, Dr. Fia share more. Um, I encourage you to do that. It'll be a great time together of learning and pursuing wisdom. All right. The code for